I'm going to, because this is a pretty young project, um, I'm going to give a little more uh, biological introduction than, than for some of these, but we'll still get to some uh, at least uh, early stage interesting computational results. So my lab is really focused on bacterial regulatory networks. We have both an experimental and a computational side, and they both come together on looking at protein DNA actions and how they are driving regulatory networks. And so just to start from the very basics and give an idea of uh, how important it is for us to really understand these regulatory networks, I want to rewind to something that everybody has probably seen again and again uh, during their career. And this is the LAC operon. Uh, this is my favorite classic example of bacterial regulatory networks. And it's a really simple system. Uh, and the experiment that was used to figure out how this system works is this. You grow E. coli. Uh, glucose and lactose. And what you see is that first the cells grow at some rate um, while they're consuming all the glucose. They run out and there's a pause in their growth. And then they start growing again more slowly eating the lactose. And so the, what won Jacob and Minot the Nobel Prize is they understood what this lag meant. It meant that the cells weren't actually making the enzymes they needed to degrade lactose until they actually needed them, until there was no glucose and there was lactose around. So this is a really uh, simple picture of a, of a regulatory response, but what we've come to appreciate recently is bacteria also have much more complex responses available to them, and these are what we really need to understand. And so to set the stage for the way these look now, I want to give a, a very similar experiment that was done uh, in the lab of Saeed Tavazoe a few years ago. So what they did, uh, it starts similar, they, st they took uh, a culture of E. coli growing at room temperature, and then they raised the temperature to 37 Celsius, to body temperature, and they watched the transcriptional output. And what they saw is a minor heat shock response, which you would expect because you've just exposed the cells to a jump in temperature. But they also saw the cells shut down their aerobic metabolism and induce their acid stress response genes and induce bile salt response genes. This makes absolutely no sense if you think in the lac operon-like context where the cells are responding directly only to a specific cue that they see in their environment. Where it makes perfect sense is in the ecological context. If you think about the broader environment in which E. coli has evolved, this is a gut microbe, and it spent its evolutionary history going from outside of mammals to inside the mammalian digestive tract and in and out. And what, in the context of that environment, does it mean when the temperature rises to body temperature? It means the bacterium has just been eaten. And it has a little while before it's going to be in an environment where there's acid and no oxygen. And right after it's done with that, it's going to get exposed to a bunch of bile salts. So what we see is bacterial regulatory networks have evolved to internalize common correlation structures in their environment uh, and to make use of those to anticipate changes in the environment. And you can even, uh, for example, decouple these uh, by changing uh, the conditions and the correlations within the environment uh, and then tracking um, the, the um, evolution of the cells over time. So, we have shown uh, in some other experiments that I won't get into here that there are actually a, um, some cases where we could exploit these anticipatory regulations to make cells more sensitive uh, to some antibiotics by tricking them to mount an incorrect response. Uh, so what we would really like to do, though, uh, is to be able to understand the molecular logic uh, that's driving these things. So if we want to understand a bacterial regulatory network, we have to look at it on multiple different levels, because these, these are composed of a set of Wow, this actually started working. Uh, these are composed a set of a set of biomolecular interactions. This is, for example, the LAC repressor interacting with its target DNA, but it's also a network. And so we need to have uh, corresponding approaches to look at these things everywhere from the molecular detail up through the network level if we really want to be able to predict uh, the behavior of these networks. The experimental data that we're bringing into this, and then I'll get into a minute where Blue Waters comes in, because it ends up being crucial for us to really figure out what's going on with all of this, um, is we are trying to use high throughput approaches to measure um, the biomolecular interactions that drive microbial behavior and then make sense of them. And so that means we're trying to measure things at a genome scale, for example, and be able to look at where all of the protein DNA interactions are or where all of the protein RNA interactions are under some condition, and then watch, watch how those change under differing experimental conditions. And there are a lot of benefits to using this kind of unbiased approach. Uh, it lets us 
um, look at network components without any preconceptions of what they're doing. It lets us find new things uh, that uh, elements that we thought we already understood are actually doing. Uh, a big one is it gives us efficient coverage of a lot of different conditions uh, because we only have to do one type of experiment per condition instead of, for example, looking at each transcription factor separately and seeing where it binds under each condition, which nobody has enough money to do. Um, and one of the most important ones I want you to keep in mind uh, as I unfold the biology here a little bit is we need to understand model organisms too. We're looking here at E. coli, but if you look at the microbiome of a typical human, you have tens of thousands of bacterial strains and species that are in your body and important to your health, either because they're beneficial or deleterious or some combination uh, thereof. And so all of the approaches that we're developing in E. coli, we want to make applicable uh, to a wide variety of bacterial systems. And ideally, we'd be able to offload as much of this as possible to computational predictions about how these organisms are going to behave. Okay, so I'm not going to dwell on this experimental setup, but this is a quick thumbnail of the experimental approaches that we're using uh, to snapshot where there are protein DNA interactions under a physiological condition. So we grow the cells, and there's DNA shown as a double magenta line, and then proteins as ovals. We can chemically cross-link protein to DNA, blow the cells up, and shred down the DNA. And then we can do a mixed organic aqueous uh, solvent extraction that lets us get the free DNA to partition into one phase and the protein DNA complexes to partition into a different phase. And then by sequencing the DNA, we find inside uh, this separate interface layer, uh, we can look at where that is on the genome and we can find where there was protein occupancy under that experimental condition. Starting with a case where we already know what the answer is, um, this just to give an idea of what these data actually look like. Uh, this is a gene pure C. Uh, it's involved in purine biosynthesis, and so this is just a schematic of the genome. The genes here are all oriented this way in the view of the uh, slides. These are known transcription factor binding sites, and these are transcription start sites. So we know that pure C goes up about sevenfold in transcription in minimal media compared to rich media. In minimal media, the cells don't have a bunch of things like nucleotides available, and so they have to make them on their own. And we know why this is also. We know from some of these experiments where people looked at one transcription factor at a time that there's a binding site for the repressor pure R right here. And this should be occupied in rich media and should be repressing transcription of pure C. And that impression should lift in minimal media. And so if we look now at the occupancy signal that we get from this method called iPod HR, um, stands for in vivo protein occupancy display at high resolution. Um, my PI insisted on that when I was a postdoc, um, in, using iPod. Uh, what we see is in rich media, where this site should be occupied, we see this nice binding peak right on top of the known pure R binding site. In, it's away. But the really important thing to consider here is we weren't looking ahead of time for pure R, and we didn't know ahead of time we wanted to look at this site. But rather, we're getting signal from a huge variety of transcription factors at all of the possible sites in the genome. And then we can actually see where things are changing. OK, so the great thing that this lets us do then is find new regulatory logic when we don't even know where to look to start with. And so here I'm going to give the example of a gene. This is called YHAO. And so we know it goes up 20-fold in rich media compared to minimal media. But there are no annotated transcription factor binding sites upstream of it, which would be right around here. And there are no annotated uh, transcription start sites even for this gene. So we can figure out where the core promoter is from some RNA sequencing data that we have. We can tell that right around here is where the main promoter elements are. And then we look at these protein occupancy signals. And what we see is in minimal media, where this thing is turned off, there's a bunch of protein occupancy sitting right on top of the core promoter, where a repressor would classically bind. And in rich media, where it's instead active, we see a further upstream binding site, which would be the classic place for a transcriptional activator. To give another example, and we have some more information on this that helps us to unfold the story, um, this is a gene called SDAC over here. We know it is 25 lower in expression in, rich, in, uh, sorry, in minimal media compared to rich media. And here, when we look at the protein occupancy profiles, we see there's a nice occupancy peak upstream of the promoter. 
uh, in rich media where this thing is active. And so again, this is screaming a transcriptional activator. But again, as with the previous case, there is no annotated transcription factor binding site here. And I should mention at this point, uh, because a lot of people are under the misconception that E. coli is like this hydrogen atom of regulatory networks that we already understand, we only know where about a third of the transcription factors in this organism bind. So there's a lot that we still don't know, even about this regulatory network that we need to learn. So what we could do in this case is try to figure out what protein is binding to this site. And the way that we do this is we take um, some DNA with a biotin attached that has the sequence here that's bound, and we try to pull down the protein that might bind to it. And so we were able to identify a protein called YIEP that appeared to bind to this region. And sure enough, what we could do then is take some labeled DNA corresponding to this region, as well as a control, and add more and more YIEP. And this is a, a gel shift, it's called. And as we add the YIEP, we see the mobility of that sequence change, which means we've actually identified in this unbiased way what protein is binding to this site. So when we are looking at the genome scale at the binding peaks we see in this iPod data, about a third of them correspond to annotated sites. Um, a little more than a third can uh, correspond to computationally predicted sites of known transcription factors. A lot of those are probably wrong assignments, but you can at least pretend that those are what they are. Uh, and then a chunk of them are definitely unassigned, and probably a big chunk of this are, we're also not able to uh, identify yet which transcription factor uh, is responsible for these sites. So one thing we can do based on this data is we can chunk the genome into different levels of iPod occupancy going from left to right, and we can find sequence motifs that are overrepresented in the high occupancy regions. And th this should let us figure out then wh what types of motifs are being recognized by the transcription factors that are active in a given environment. And when we do this, we see cases like this where you have a pretty good match between what you infer solely based on the iPod data and a known um, transcription factor position weight matrix. These are uh, just the frequencies of different bases present at different positions in the binding site. You're going to see a lot of figures like this uh, in the rest of the talk. Uh, and so under any given condition, we can find um, motifs uh, that match about 30% of the known transcription factors, and it changes which transcription factors you see under different conditions. But we also see a lot of motifs that look like this in the motif inference data. And so these things have an inverse dyad symmetry, which is what you expect for bacterial transcription factors a lot of the time, but they don't correspond to any characterized um, transcription factors. And so the question then becomes, uh, what transcription factors each of these things correspond to, and how can we predict uh, in an easier way than doing these mass spec-based pull-downs on each individual uh, binding site that we're interested in, what is binding to each of these sites? So um, now I need to step a little bit more into the domain of how people do high throughput measurements to try and measure for a particular transcription factor where it binds. And so there are experimental approaches for doing this. I'm actually going to skip this slide. Um, and uh, here are a couple of the methods that people have tried. Um, so one way is to use what are called protein binding microarrays, where um, you take uh, the protein of interest and pretty much pull, it, you um, let it bind to a um, microarray, after you fluorescently label it, you let it bind to a microarray that has um, sequence chunks that contain all possible DNA sequences. And then you try to find the motifs that are overrepresented in the places where that protein binds. Another approach uh, is called HT Selex, and in this case, um, people do successive rounds of enriching DNA sequences from a random pool that bind to a particular protein and then sequence it, and they see what um, a particular protein will bind to. And so these are both um, approaches that have given us pretty good information on um, where human transcription factors bind, in terms of what the binding site preferences are for human transcription factors and for other model organisms. So the problem here is we care, going to bacteria, we care about things other than model organisms. We care about tens of thousands of bacterial strains and species, and so we need some more rapid way than trying to use these experimental methods uh, to generate position weight matrices for all the transcription factors to understand how this regulatory network works. And so there have been various efforts over time to use computational approaches to take a structure 
of a transcription factor and a co-crystal structure of the transcription factor with DNA and predict what the position weight matrix for that transcription factor will look like. They've generally done very badly. Um, but one case where there was a lot of success was in this study um, by the Grubmuller group. Uh, they took a zinc finger transcription factor, which are known to be especially rigid, which I, I think ended up helping them, as we'll discuss in a moment. And using a computational approach, they were able to look at all single base pair perturbations of that binding site using free energy calculations and get a 0.6 kcal per mole average deviation from the experimental values. So this is really great. And if we could get this level of performance uh, on a broad scale, we would be able to computationally map out the binding affinity landscapes of transcription factors. So what we want to do and what we're currently working on um, is taking a set of transcription factors with good position weight matrices that were derived either from CellX data or from protein binding microarrays and then predict what is the uh, landscape of binding free energies to all of biologically relevant sequences. Now, that's a very important term. I'll describe what I mean by that in a moment. And so there are a lot of things that we ought to be able to learn from this. The simplest thing is, okay, we're going to predict binding free energy landscapes for each of these transcription factors purely computationally. Uh, and then I think a very important downstream objective here is ideally we would like to get to the point where even though we can predict these free energy landscapes from molecular dynamics simulations, we don't have to. So ideally we would like to be able to just take the structures, uh, the co-crystal structures, and do the prediction straight from that. So far those approaches have done very badly, and I'm suspicious that one of the reasons for that is there are interactions that are not present in the crystal structure but that will become apparent when you actually have dynamics that are crucial to recognition. And so we want to uh, grasp the molecular interactions that are actually important. Uh, to defining these binding free energy landscapes through the simulations. Um, we want to also understand um, the nature of interactions between transcription factors because we've also identified a lot of cases where if two transcription factors bind near each other um, on a piece of DNA, even if they are not directly interacting with each other, they change each other's position weight matrices. And so we have to understand the mechanics of how uh, somehow this uh, information transfers through the DNA uh, to change these position weight matrices. Um, and last, and I think actually this should have gone first because it's the first thing we're going to have to figure out. This is a really great test for force fields and for the protein nucleic interactions that are currently present in MD force fields. Uh, and so we have good experimental data. We should be able to do these calculations. And to whatever extent uh, we see systematic deviations from the experimental data, it highlights places where we need to imp be improving the current generation of force fields. The method that we're actually using, and we're adapting this very closely from uh, the Grubmuller study where this actually worked very well in one particular transcription factor. Um, if you consider first a coarse grain view of the problem we're trying to study, what we really want to know is the difference in binding free energy of a transcription factor to one DNA sequence and a different DNA sequence where one base pair has been changed. And so really that means you're looking for the difference between delta G3 and delta G4 here. Now, nobody actually wants to calculate delta G3 and delta G4 directly because you would have to do something like a pulling simulation or a binding simulation, which would be impossible to sample in each of those cases. But we can take advantage of the thermodynamic cycle here and instead calculate the difference between delta G1 and delta G2, which are the free energies for perturbing that base pair in the presence versus in the absence of uh, that protein uh, in the co-crystal, or in the, in, the, in the bound structure, I should say. And so there's an additional wrinkle um, that Grubmuller's group put on this that seems to work very nicely. And so what they showed um, was a method for using a non-equilibrium uh, thermodynamic integration calculations to calculate these free energies. Uh, and you can look at this reference if you're interested. I won't go into it in too much detail now. But the thumbnail sketch is um, in each of the endpoints, the, the DNA by itself, with or without the mutation, or in the presence of the transcription factor, with or without the mutation, you run a long simulation to get good sampling in the physically realistic states. And then you can perform a series of short switching simulations where you take uncorrelated snapshots from each of those long trajectories and rapidly uh, convert the um, uh, base pair to the mutated form or from the mutated form to the uh, original uh, base pair uh, in a thermodynamic integration calculation. And then you can use the results of many of these non-equilibrium trajectories to reconstruct the free energy change for this mutation. 
And so there are a couple things to really love about this method. One of them is you spend most of your simulation time on the physical endpoint states. And that means that they serve dual purpose because you simultaneously are gaining information about the structure of the protein DNA complex, which we're interested in for other reasons, and doing sampling is going to help with your free energy calculations because the main uh, barrier to gain good statistics on this is how many different uncorrelated snapshots you have. Um, and another thing is this means you're spending most of your um, sampling time on normal MD cal calculations, which are much easier to get GPU accelerated than any kind of free energy calculation. And so this makes it well suited for the computational architectures which we have, which I'll talk about in a moment. So what we're doing in practice is we have this, um, in this case, we're looking at the transcription factor ELK1 bound to DNA. Uh, we have this uh, complex structure. There's a region in here that corresponds to the recognition site of the transcription factor. And we want to go over and map out what are the free energy changes for all of the um, changes in sequence that we care about inside that recognition region. And so this is the position weight matrix for ELK1. And so you can see some, some of the positions like these in the core are uh, much more highly uh, favored in the, to have the uh, reference uh, base pair in them. Some of the ones around the end, there's much less of a free energy difference between the reference base pair and the others. And so this is our target data now that we would like to be able to reproduce um, in the calculations. And so, and I should also add this target data, which considers each base pair independently, could be reproduced by looking at each base pair independently in the binding site. But we're also interested in going one better and actually figuring out uh, the second and third order corrections that you get as you change multiple base pairs simultaneously from the reference sequence. And so what we're doing then is, for all these different changes I'm talking about, we're just using these free energy calculations to perturb one base pair to another. Now, to get the first round mutations that I was talking about, it's a pretty reasonable set of um, simulations in terms of number. For each position, you take the reference base pair, calculate the change in free energy to go into each other possible base pair. And so that means you have three N first round mutations for each of the, um, for N uh, being the length of the binding site that you care about. Uh, but as I said, we'd like to also get to all of the possible um, sequences that are of biological interest, and that turns into a combinatorial explosion as you start considering different mutations on the first round calculation. So the shortcut that we're going to make use of um, is the fact that you can stop a lot of these trees pretty early. If you see one perturbation that is so heavily thermodynamically disfavored uh, that there's no way you're going to be able to recover that binding free energy later to make a physically relevant sequence, you can stop considering that tree at all. And so you're only going to consider second and third round mutations uh, along the branches of this tree uh, that don't immediately give a very unfavorable free energy. And so the estimates of this should end up being a couple hundred total sequences to get a good map for the binding site like this. Okay, so we are using, guys, Pusco and Klaus's group, please don't kill me. Um, we're using AMBER for this because we're doing a bunch of, five minutes, okay. So we're doing a bunch of independent single node calculations. Initially, we're doing sampling on a bunch of different sequences, and then we're doing a much larger number of these non-equilibrium thermodynamic switching calculations. So this parallelizes embarrassingly. We just run each one on a node. Um, so we're doing right now 100 to 200 nanosecond equilibrium runs of each uh, structure, although we're taking a few of them much longer to see uh, in practice whether we're doing enough sampling with that. The initial indications are that we are. Um, and then fast growth um, thermodynamic integration calculations at 64 snapshots in each trajectory. And then we have an in-house tool, tool chain for post-processing all of these inf this information. And a really important point here is looking at uh, the correlation times in these simulations and making sure we actually know what our error bars look like and we're getting independent data. I'm going to skip a little bit over some of the gory details here. Um, and so Blue Waters is really perfect for this because we can consider these hundreds of different mutations that we care about on enough GPU nodes to actually run these things in parallel. Uh, we have access to GPU nodes for the long trajectories and CPU nodes for the thermodynamic integration calculations. And thanks to the Cheatham Lab, we have this really nice tuned build of Amber on Blue Waters that we're getting good performance with. So, uh, I have the one piece of data that I wanted to show, and I'm going to be done uh, after I give a, a little bit of uh, uh, commentary on this. 
So we're trying to reproduce um, this position weight matrix. And as I said, this project is still in the early stages. So the actual data slide I'm going to show came to me exactly an hour ago from a postdoc who's been laboring heroically on this. Uh, and so what we have just gotten is all of the free energy changes for the first round perturbations um, to this binding site for ELK1. And so this axis is the um, delta delta G in units of RT as you do these um, mutations. And these are each of the positions in the binding site and all possible mutations. And so you can see here three bars. One, the green bars are for the protein binding microarray data we have for this. One, the red is for the HT Selex data on this. And one is for the molecular dynamics simulations. And so what we see in this data is there appears to be a strong overstabilization in what we have so far of the reference sequence. So because this is really preliminary, we now need to see, OK, does this happen consistently with the other three transcription factors that we have? And can we understand uh, what is going on with this? But what I can say for sure, I'll skip over that, um, is there are both some computational experimental follow-ups that we need to pursue here um, as we get more information on this. Definitely on the experimental side, um, there needs to be some comparison of the high throughput mapping of the binding sites with low throughput mapping, which is something we're working on and some other labs are as well, uh, to make sure that uh, the approach is actually giving good descriptions of the binding free energy landscapes. On the computational side, we're going to be looking at long time scale behavior and make sure we're not undersampling these systems. And also, a great thing I think we'll be able to do once we have these initial data sets is look at perturbations of all the endpoints to other force fields and see how those force fields would have performed in comparison with what we were using uh, in this case. And eventually, we'd like to use this to understand uh, the structural basis for DNA protein interaction specificities and hopefully come up with more computationally tractable models than doing all these simulations uh, that'll let us better predict these binding free energy landscapes. So it sounds like, and I just wanted to throw in one note. This is reminding me a lot of something I had done in grad school where we were trying to do protein folding. It, um, and we ended up, because this was before all the latest rounds of protein force fields came out, we ended up having a beta strand uh, structure that was completely overstabilized into alpha helical structures. Um, but uh, simulations like that were able to show us where there were problems in the protein force fields. And hopefully now we'll be able to do the same thing uh, in protein nucleic acid interactions. So um, with that, I'd like to thank the people who we've worked with on this. On the experimental side, Tom Goss in my lab and Saeed Tavazoi, who is my postdoc advisor. On the simulation side, Morteza Kabiri is a postdoc in my lab. Um, R2 Jolma uh, had grabbed all that uh, Celex data for us and provided it to us early. And Gary Stormo has been uh, very helpful in talking to us about uh, proper ways to analyze the Celex data uh, funding. And of course, the Blue Waters time that's making all the uh, calculations possible. So hopefully, next year, we'll have a lot more uh, information on this. But like Donald Rumsfeld said, uh, you go to the conference with the data you have, not the data you want. <laughs>